put our intro in a minute. Um, beautiful. Uh, should we start? Yeah? Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, hello, and thank you for joining us for Ritual Archives, a conversation with Jessica Harvey and Candice Lynn, and it's the final program in our series, Archives as Reparative Technology with Archive Acts, AKA Crystal Z Campbell. Um, so we started this series talking uh, about artist run, archives, digitization, and metadata. And today we're going to the other end of the spectrum, uh, burying things in the ground, uh, petrification and putrefaction, putrefaction. And um, yeah, Jessica and Candice are not traditional archivists, but as artists, their materials, processes, and the mythologies they create speak to these much more human and less sterile roots of archiving that we might not otherwise consider. So yes, very excited to see where today's conversation takes us. And please give us a warm round of applause welcoming Jessica Harvey and Candice. <laughs> Um, and I guess to start, uh, we'll just go right into images, if that sounds good. I don't know who wants to start. Jessica, alphabetical. Hello, Jessica, you, Jessica, do you want to start with images? Jessica, you're muted. Okay, is that good? Now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with a the first project I'm gonna talk about three um, women and kind of their archives, two are familial and one um, is not. Uh, so the first project um, deals with, this is an image of um, cremated remains, a photogram of cremated remains. Um, I unexpectedly became the caretaker for my aunt at the end of her life and in clearing out her house. I was the one that was responsible for that. Um, I found a box that was marked kids and I thought they were photographs and she didn't have any human children. Um, and when I opened it up, they were all these smaller boxes of um, cremated remains of her pets. So um, that she considered her children. And then um, as I went throughout her house, I found a lot of things that reference the body, but without the body in its complete form. So um, these like dentures, um, this piece is actually um, a metronome. Um, when I was taking care, of, when I was helping to care for her, the day that she died, I would always take her um, heartbeat reading. And so this was the reading from the last day that she was died, that the last day that she was alive. And um, she collected all sorts of things. So these crystals and metronomes were part of her collection. And I timed the metronomes to be off beat um, for the reading of the day that she died. Um, and then in working with this work, I've done some writing as well. So I was gonna read um, a short piece uh, from that. Um, and this is about Buddy, which was one of her pets. Um, this one's called Buddy. Buddy. Buddy was a good boy. Now what's left fits in the palm of my hand. Granular like silt, the ocean floor or dust swept from the corner of a room. 
but he was a good boy. Travel is different these days. Rides in cars, front seats traded for trunks, tucked neatly in a box with your brothers for safekeeping or the next destination. But he was a good boy. Um, and then this next work, uh, just briefly, um, and we can talk more about it. I went on a journey where I um, followed a saint, uh, the youngest saint who was, her body was entombed in wax and she went on this kind of spectacular journey around the United States, the East Coast of the US and Midwest. Um, and I was really interested in who got to tell her story now that she was dead. Her name's Maria Goretti and her bones are put in this um, wax entombment, except for her right arm, which is in Italy. And um, I was gonna read a short piece about that, which is called Wax Tomb. I wouldn't call my burial a peaceful one, but it was still, the earth was soft yet sharp, cutting and comforting all at once. This was my home, 11 years of life, 48 years of rest. Now I'm paraded around the streets, bones entombed in wax, save for my right arm, a phantom limb somewhere in Italy. It gave me martyrdom and eternity, but did not save me. Instead, my days are spent encased in glass, toured around the country, as true believers gather in mass, hoping to catch a glimpse of something holy. But now I am a wax tomb, a reliquary lit by LEDs. Press your body against a version of mine. No, I am not incorruptible as you become a relic. And then finally, just to like maybe put some humor in there, um, this is a piece um, from my mom's archive actually where she would fart into this jar and um, you know gave it to me uh, as a gift. And then I also have a recording um, that I'll just play a minute of where she, my mom would record her farts and try Hello. to hear there. Are you there? You're gonna hear some farts now. So <laughs> that piece goes on for about five minutes. So my mom would try to record these sounds and leave them on our, my sister and mine's voicemail message, but could never um, do it on time. So my dad gave her a dictaphone where she could create her own archive. Um, so I'm interested in just, you know, women who get to tell their stories and also a bit of humor and tragedy mixed in as a start. Thank you, Jessica. That was really amazing. And um, it makes me so excited for our conversation. And um, Lucas and Crystal, thank you. What a great pairing. I feel like we have so many, um, so many things that we like in common. Not only that we both have cat pillows that match um, okay, share screen. Okay. Does that look good? I can't tell, I can't look at, see what you're saying. So I hope it looks right. Yes, that looks good. Okay. Um, so I was trying to think of three images, uh, to introduce my work and, um, was also kind of thinking of words that maybe go with them. And I was thinking about um, this work, which was called A Hard White Body on Court Blanc a Key, that was at Beton Salon in 2017 in Paris. Um, I was thinking about the words contamination and intimacy and um, maybe unstable archives. I was looking 
at uh, two people, James Baldwin and his time in France and specifically when he was in Paris and Jean Beret, a peasant woman who lived in the 18th century and was possibly the first woman to circumnavigate the globe in a colonial expedition on, uh, headed by Bougainville. And um, I created this room out of unfired porcelain, roughly based on the description of the apartment in Baldwin's book, Giovanni's Room, but also based on these uh, accounts of the cramped small ship cabin that Jean Beret went around the globe in. And I was interested in thinking about recreation of spaces that were both like described somewhat claustrophobically, but also as spaces of freedom in some way, um, like restricted freedom. Um, and so this, this installation, this room was kept wet by a urinal that was hooked up to a distillation system when you came into the space and you were invited to give your piss and everybody that worked in the space um, had to give their piss. Or they didn't have to, but they all wanted to. And we all, um, like we did a little testing of the distillation and drinking each other's piss in the beginning of the show, which was fun. Um, and so the piss and the was distilled and then mixed with um, plants that came from a list of a notebook that possibly was written in by Jean Beret that were plants for calming the skin. And this would mist down on the sculpture um, for like 30 seconds every hour. And it eventually still did turn yellow and crack and grow mushrooms. And, um, and that's the picture you see on the right. And yeah, we can say more later about this work, but that's what I'll say for now. And then another word I was thinking about in relation to my work was um, uh, leakage and stains. So this work, System for a Stain, was originally made for Gasworks in 2016 and was recomposed for Banff in 2019. And it had um, fermenting tea and sugar up in the upper right jar that gets siphoned down into a copper distillation system that distills it and um, creates heat that creates a dye bath of cochineal. And the this leaks out in a separate space, um, which is the image on the right, slowly over time, um, be growing bigger and bigger and like kind of like this dark reddish purple color. And lastly, oh, um, this is a more recent work I just finished in the beginning of the year, which is my future coffin, of which has a portrait of my future self with future cats, um, and is based loosely on like Chinese Tang Dynasty funeral ceramics, like the Lokapala Tomb Guardian statues, and uh, also Etruscan sarcophagi. And it's um, filled with a lot of dirt and composting worms and a watering system that's on a timer. And the pots that you see in the sculpture kind of lift up to reveal holes into the earth that um, the, the people that worked in for the show would uh, replenish and I would come and visit the show with um, waste materials like uh, from their lunches and, and eating. Um, so yeah, it's in my backyard now. It's waiting for my future body to go inside there and be eaten by worms. And um, oh, the word I was thinking about in relationship to this slide was interspecies. A lot of my work is thinking about my relationship to other species, plants, non-human animals. Um, so it seems like there's a connection to Jessica's work there too. Thank you for that. Those are really compelling uh, introductions. Um, I was really interested in the way, uh, in both of your practices, um, the way that research and storytelling sort of informs um, the moves that you make in your work and the strategies you end up using. And 
this sort of interrogation of the archive, whether it's sort of a personal interrogation or a you know systematic or systemic um, interrogation, and thinking through like oral histories and um, maybe the conflicts in in what materials tell versus what. Uh, humans tell and really wanted to hear sort of um, you speak on that. Who do you want to speak first? I got distracted by Lucas's cat. Sorry. Uh, Wait, you're head blocking everyone. your cat now? <laughs> yeah, to just Jess Jessica, do you want to respond first? Sure. Um, yeah, I think a lot of there's so much that goes on like behind, I'm sure too with your work, Candace, is like behind the scenes and like what you're sifting through and what you end up taking away from the research or like research uh, that you do for each project. Um, you know, I think there is, for me at least, I think a lot about, you know, especially when it comes to like oral oral history um, or spoken history and storytelling, how I'm kind of just like an inner, like an intermediary between like what comes to me and then like what, what ends up um, coming out. And a lot of times like going into a project I don't necessarily know the like what material is going to be used um, into, and a lot of times I will either like learn to work with a new like I have a photo based background, so I feel like you know um, like lens based something is always a part of the work, but um, oftentimes I'll either like learn how to work with a new material, um, you know, with the project with my. Um, and like I use the cremated remains of the pets for the photograms. And then I also um, turned each pet, made a crystal for each pet with their remains um, and kind of thinking about like how it's not as something that's as stable as like a diamond, but I think about like preciousness and then also like instability. So like when you talked about like the unstable archive, Candace, that really stuck um, with me. That's interesting to hear about. Like, I feel like, um, I feel like I am also like somebody that's always like trying, I love the experimental stage in the studio more than like finishing things. And so I'm always like trying to learn new materials too, but I often feel like my research begins with the materials. So like I got really into dyeing with cochineal and now recently with indigo, which has made me research and like want to know more about it. Um, that's the, the hard white body piece started by me just getting really into the medium of porcelain. Um, and then and then I found out like, as I read more about it, like it had such a fascinating and racialized history. Um, but yeah, I think uh, in terms of like the archives, I feel like um, a lot of my research was like a lot of like very book heavy for a while. And like, I would get interested in the material, start reading about it. And then as I started to try to like visit actual like archives um, to look at documents and stuff, I was really struck by like what wasn't there and what was like missing or um, couldn't be captured. Um, Saidiya Hartman has this like really great line. I always think about like, I'm gonna butcher it probably, but something around um, like, how do you make physical or like visible precarious lives that are only visible in the moment of their disappearance. So I think a lot of my work, which is like thinking around marginalized histories is, is about um, finding maybe alternate modalities of trying to access archives that don't exist or like are um, maybe exist, but not in traditional means. Thank you. Um, kind of on that subject, I, I guess I, I've been thinking, well, Candace, first some question. I'm curious, have you, if you've worked with remains before, 
or if you have avoided that. Um, and then I was thinking about uh, Jessica when you we had a chance to talk earlier and we were talking about like kind of the moral responsibility of like dealing with someone's remains that you found or, or these objects from your family or, or people from your family. And Candace, I was thinking about that for, when I first met you, you were working on that project at the Gamble House that was like this fictional history told through these kind of artifacts of this like white man who had went to Japan and created this. Anyway, I'm thinking about like looting and marginalized people and like the disrespect, respect of the archivist and like uh, how you negotiate the like moral weight or uh, navigate those ethical questions or where how those ethical questions inspire you. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll begin this one. Um, yeah, I so that work that you refer to that was um, based on George Salamazar, who was probably was a European, probably a French person who didn't actually go to Japan. He pretended to be from Formosa, present day Taiwan, and invented like the pseudo ethnography and language and et cetera. So I had made some objects based on his language letter forms and other things. Um, and I guess for me, like, I think there's so many artists who work with um, questions of like repatriation and looting and those kinds of archival questions so well. And it's, I rather just kind of leave that to them. I'm not really interested in moral questions in my art. Um, and I sometimes get questions around consent or morality when I give talks and I'm, I don't mean to be dismissive because I think they're important questions, but I also like just personally, that's not where I want to spend my time thinking about it. I'm not really that moved by ethical questions. I hope that's okay to say. Um, and I haven't worked with human remains, but I, you know, I'm always working with living materials that then die like plants that become dried plants that are dead and um, plants that I, you know, ingest that are, that are dead, but have some spirit in them and insects that are alive at some point and then dead. So there are remains of bacteria and insects and plants in my work, but I've never um, worked with human remains, yeah. And uh, maybe just one more thing is that that, that Salamazar piece was for me not about, um, it was more about like I was really interested in how the fiction or the construction of race has changed. And so I was more interested in the way that he was able to racially pass as different just through um, performing culture and language and that that was possible at the time that it wasn't so based on phenotype. And I thought that was really interesting. So it wasn't really about um, anything around looting or appropriation of culture. Yeah, I think I think we were talking about when we talked earlier, um, when I was, you know, going through all my aunt's things. Um, when she was sick, she was in a state where she couldn't, she was in and out of certain sorts of consciousness. So I didn't know exactly what was in the house and we weren't close. We were actually like somewhat estranged. It was just by happenstance that like I was the person that ended up taking care of her because I was in out East and I was living in Chicago at the time and I was doing a different photo project and I went to visit her at the hospital. And then I just ended up staying and taking care of her till she passed away. But in her home, I did find like a box of cremated remains that nobody knew who the person was. It wasn't anyone related to anyone in my family. And, you know, I do think, you know, for right now, I've just been carting this person with me everywhere that I've gone um, because, you know, I don't know why my aunt had her remains and, um, you know, I, if she had family, uh, maybe she didn't want them to have her remains. So now I just kind of have them and have been um, traveling with them. But I think it's like an ongoing um, conversation, <laughs> definitely. 
I'm really fascinated by the way that um, various materials produced or sounds produced or smells produced by various bodies play into both of your practices. Um, and I'm really curious about, you know, how we, um, and Candace, I keep going back to, um, you know, the, the hard white body and thinking about uh, passing, passing um, in different forms. Like, um, can we pass with queer identity in another country where we can't in the countries that we're from or, can we pass um, between different identities to achieve certain positions or, you know, these kinds of things. But also, um, Jessica, thinking about, you know, this idea of, of inheriting um, materials, inheriting materials and the process of distillation, which is an actual strategy in Candace's work, um, thinking about how we distill um, all of these ideas, all of these materials um, and all of these forms into, into art, you know, and, and is, that, is that the thing? Is art the thing, I guess? I'm always curious about whether this form is, um, can, the, can the forms hold the ideas or do you feel like there's always sort of um, this evolution. I know, Candice, your work changes with each installation of it. And um, I wonder sort of where that stops and starts, or if this is just a sort of a continual process. You know, I, I, you know, I do, the thing I do like about art making is that you can have the same piece, but it can change. It, it has different lives. Um, each time it's shown. So um, that's a little bit different for like writing than which seems a bit more like static and fixed in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, I, in my work too, I, I think some, I think in working with like archives and familial archives, I've also become sort of like a repository for other people's things. So like people have, given me like their bodily material because they're like, well, you're an artist. So, and you've been working with these things. So maybe you'll be able to um, use my like hair or my nails. So I've definitely gotten things from people um, before, even if it's not necessarily what I'm doing at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I think too, like a lot of times uh, or a few times people have like given me um, things like when my aunt was still alive, like years ago, she had gifted me a box of photographs from an ex that was like, I think pretty like explosive and abusive. And it was his like familial, it was his family photographs. And it was like from the time he was born until he became an adult. So um, I did a project or, and still I'm doing a project where she gave me these images and I had no idea what to do with them. I had never actually met this person either. So um, I actually ended up uh, taking the image and then I would remove the silver and make another like um, transfer um, from his work. But um, yeah. <laughs> um. When you were talking about hair, hair and fingernails being gifted to you, it reminded me that when I was in high school, I started a hair collection and I asked, I wanted to collect everyone in my high schools. I went to a Catholic high school with like priests and stuff. Um, I wanted to collect their hair. I only got like 70 or something, but I had this, these like sheets in a binder that had people's hair with their, their names on it. So it started early. Um, and I probably would have started even earlier if like there were certain things my parents just wouldn't let me keep or do. Like I always wanted to keep like the chicken head or like different things from banquets, but they weren't, they didn't allow me. Um, and then I'm trying to think through it. There were so many different aspects of your question, Crystal, that were interesting. Um, there was, uh, you were asking something about um, the, 
aspect of passing. Yeah, I feel like there's something I wanted to articulate around, like with the Hard White Body Project, the reason why I wanted to ask for people's piss um, to be used as like a act of caretaking to like keep the sculpture that was made out of this super fragile when unfired. It's like the most fragile ceramic material when unfired that's so prone to being cracked and broken. Um, there was something I was interested in doing around taking what's normally like a waste material or a material that's like abject um, and using it in a kind of act of preservation and caretaking, even if it's a futile one. Um, so I think a lot of my work is like interested in in systems of value or like processes that create value. So like I use distillation a lot in my work because it's a industrial and colonial process that's been used to like um, take something like sugar and then create alcohol, which is a more valuable commodity out of it. So I've been really interested in using these kind of um, processes of increasing value, but using them in ways that um, don't create value, like that create a stain or create a broken thing that can't be collected or like bought. And then I don't know how to answer the one in terms of like, where does it end? Like, I don't, I don't know if it ends, I don't know. I don't think it ends at the art. That would be sad. I think if it ends at the art, I think it, I hope it goes on. Yeah. And I guess like I'm thinking about, um, you know, going back to the title of this talk, Ritual, Ritual Archives, and thinking about the way, you know, you um, sort of infuse the work, the practice of viewing the work with with um, offering tea or something like this, right? And Jessica recently had um, an exhibition, was it a year ago already, at um, an, a fellow artist and writer's home, Liz Blood, um, that incorporated uh, images of the saint and um, inhabited a bathroom and sort of disrupted the ritual of of uh, that experience, right? Um, so maybe we can hear a little bit more about sort of the rituals that you, that you create or disrupt or honor in 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 those practices. Um, yeah, um, the, that show that you were talking about, it did, it made me think of all the like layers of ritual that went along for that piece. So like I had followed this saint for like almost a month on the road and like, I hadn't ever expected to, like my mom was like, you should really check out this thing that's happening. There's this wax saint that's being toured around the U S and I was actually like pretty like disturbed and like actually grossed out, not gro grossed out by like how it was being presented. The tour was being presented as this was a saint of like chastity and purity. And she was like touring the U S to kind of bring some sort of, to bring back that sort of value. And so I didn't even want to go. Um, but after the first day I went and saw her on this tour and she was toured around all these like Catholic, churches around the United States. And I also went to Catholic school, but my mom actually pulled me out in junior high because she was, uh, she was like, no, no more. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I, when I started following around this saint, like my mom gave me all, like, I think there's this notion, I feel like I'm still a little bit superstitious. And like, even if my mom is like, separated from Catholicism, there is this like superstition that is like embedded in her being. So before I left to go on this tour, she gave me all these things I could turn into relics. And like I, I had written a piece piece about that and, you know, but the things she gave me were like pretty unconventional. Like she gave me some cremated remains of her brother. She gave me, um, a fake turd. She gave me um, this drawing of divine. And then she 
came up with, and I didn't know that she had saved them, but she saved all my sister and mine's baby teeth. And she really wanted to like have those turned into relics, which I was like, gosh, that's like, that was like a part of my body at some point. And now it's become this like third thing. So I actually ended up putting um, one of my baby teeth in that exhibit um, that got turned into a third class relic. So like if you touch like an object to this cough, like this LED lit coffin, it would turn into like a third degree relic. Um, so yeah, so that's one, that's one ritual, I guess that was kind of disturbed. I wanna be friends with your mom. She sounds cool. Um, yeah, I, uh, I feel like I get asked kind of often about like how ritual functions in my work and I don't know why, but I always just have a really hard time answering that. Like it, I feel like clearly there is an aspect of ritual in my work, but I think it's also like ritual is just like kind of, um, in my life in a really secular way. Um, so I, I almost don't notice it when it's in my art, it's just like, that's just kind of continuous. And I, I guess I, maybe I think of it more as like propositions, like um, not like sexual propositions, but just like propositions for the world. Um, like, like, yeah, I mean, it's like what I was saying earlier, like using processes that are tied to industrialization and violence, but um, proposing poetic ways of unproductivity that they could be used in otherwise. And so like, you know, intention, I feel like is really important when you do rituals, it's all about like setting a different kind of intention or proposition into the world um, through a set of like actions or parameters or something you like will. Um, I feel like, oh, that's, I feel like that's an important part. Like, I feel like I'm always thinking about like, what's the will of this piece? Um, and so I, yeah, there's some work I make that like specifically looks like altars or like has a very clear connection to ritual, but there's, I think ritual in all the work, even when it doesn't look specifically around ritual, like if there's a way that I set up a scenario that has this kind of will to change a dominant narrative. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's, um, speaks to me too is like the will the will to change a dominant narrative and like break like how do you break that and what do you, what do you add to it that isn't there or hasn't been there? Yeah, in our previous conversation we were talking about um, like the act of archiving as a way of instilling something with value, like performance ephemera becomes archived and it what is otherwise just cast off now holds some kind of significance and yeah like Candace you mentioned like distillation as a way of giving something value and these are also there's a lot of overlap with like maybe not distillation but like uh preservation like uh, burying or otherwise like that these are archival practices these are also separate methods for uh, imbuing something with value and that maybe may in both your works you're detaching them from they're not applied towards archiving but these methods of instilling value are kind of reworked and reused that's not a question. Um, just I think like for my work too, a lot of times like the thing that maybe would be archived or given value is a lot of times destroyed and then a third thing's made that has like a different kind of value to it. Can I just say ditto? <laughs> Also, I want to throw out to the chat if anyone has questions. Um, okay. Sorry, I, I need to adjust multiple volume sliders. If anyone has questions in the chat, please 
uh, drop them and we can get to them. Um, Crystal, do you have, I have a couple. Yeah, yeah, I have something. Um, I guess I'm curious about like, um, you know, thinking about, um, I like what you're saying, what both of you are saying about sort of flipping the narrative and um, Candace, going back to what you were saying about sort of taking um, something that we consider to be not valuable like urine or waste um, and, and using that to sort of construct the value. Like there's certain alchemical process in that, right? And a certain sort of like, um, you know, giving it, uh, giving that attention, giving it that language. Um, and I wondered, you know, how, I guess in other ways of thinking through like the scatological, like ephemera of our existence, like how do we sort of, um, I wanted to hear maybe your thoughts on sort of the hierarchies of of these materials for your for your own practice like is there an intention to sort of break down those hierarchies in your practice that's such a good question um i feel like i have been so indebted to mel, mel y chen's um book animacies which talks about like this idea of the animacy hierarchy and it's something I feel like when I read it, I was like, oh, this is what I've been trying to articulate in my work for so long. And it gave me like language to be able to do that. But it talks about how we like um, think about life and um, materials and value them according to like how much um, sentience or like kind of able-bodied mobility we attribute to them. Um, so that like, you know, to call someone like, um, you know, like you're always gonna be, your insults are always gonna be like downgrading a person on this like invisible hierarchy, like calling them a non-human animal or a part of a non-human animal's body part or a plant. Um, like um, I think they give the example of like, you know, calling someone a vegetable or um, yeah. So I think that is really interesting to me. Like I've always been interested in, take yeah, I, alchemy is also like a weird word that often gets applied to my work, like alchemy and ritual. And I'm always like, ah, oh, yes, but I don't know how to talk about that. I guess there's something in there, but I also like have never spent time to really research alchemy and it has its own rich history, I think. So, um, but yeah, I think there's definitely something I'm interested in around like the supposed invisible hierarchy we think about to how we order like the world and life and like using materials in a way to somehow upset that assumed order. Yeah, and I, you know, I worked in a museum for a while where, you know, like the hierarchy is very strict and like laid out for you. Um, and so there was, I feel like, when also you're looking at an archive, when you talk about like the things that aren't there, but also the things that you notice that aren't given importance in the archive, like other secondary writing or like notes within like the formal object that you're looking at that, you know, um, is given the value, but like the note that's kind of like an aside also has its own, own kind of value as well. And like, I am interested in pointing maybe the light to to those to those kinds of things. Uh, just a question from the chat uh, asking about the role of community in your practice. Kind of unrelated to archiving, but <laughs> We're just gonna... <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Um, it's inter 
I mean, it's interesting because, like, I feel like all the stuff I was doing with Piss um, a couple years ago came out of um, a show. Wait, no, I don't know. I don't remember which one was the first one, but it, like, I, I did a. I did another work with Piss at Commonwealth and Council, which is like um, a gallery in Koreatown run by Young Chung and Kibum Kim. Um, and I really love that community of artists that like show there and work work with them and circulate with them, that group. Um, so we did, a, we did a get together and I had gathered everyone's Piss together and then we used it to grow this mushroom and then I cast the mushroom and patinaed it with the urine. Um, I don't, this is a bad answer. I don't know. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I guess, I think community is important in my work, but not in a social practice way. Um, I think I also like to think about community beyond humans. Um, like I'm, I'm always thinking about like, how do we think about, and, um, highlight our entanglement with non-human community and environment. Um, and yeah, and also thinking about like where the work is shown and the community of people who have to labor to like maintain and show it and make that, making that part of the work. I don't know, that wasn't a very good answer. Maybe Jessica has something better to say. I don't know if I have anything better particularly to say, but I do think about like people who are inside and outside of your orbit, like especially now when being in close proximity is so much more difficult in the ways like that you can connect um, without like, you know, um, like, like Zoom fatigue and things like that. Um, and in the project that I did with like Daybreak where each morning, almost each morning. I've not gone every single morning, but usually like my kind of like daily ritual is like getting up when the sun rises and going for a walk. And so I started to like record that. And then I created like a phone number where people could call and listen to like what today sounded like. So it's kind of a way to feel an attack, like a mediated attachment or connection. Um, but yeah, it's especially like thinking now to as, you know, things are getting a lot worse um, at this next wave of the pandemic. And um, I've been thinking a lot about how to connect um, uh, in a deeper way, but don't have quite all the answers just yet. Mm, yeah. Oh, Lucas, you have a question. Uh, I was just, I was thinking of, oh, sorry. I was thinking about like sterility and uh, like urine is sterile, but it doesn't feel that way. Like it doesn't, you don't want to believe that necessarily. And, uh, and then like a art space as having this like expectation of sterility. And then when that, expectation is interrupted like uh candace thing of your and patrick's like this testosterone blocking fog that you fill the gallery with and like the idea that you might be impacted by this space and it's not just like a clean space that you can leave and exit uh the role of sterility or or, or if if that yeah, has a power in your work. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, especially now, it's so charged to think about, like, I think so much of my work has been trying to, like, undo the fiction of purity. Um, so sterility is maybe another word for purity. Um, but purity is, like, the aspirational word for steril sterility. <laughs> um, and I think yeah, it's interesting to like, to think about that now when people are so worried about things being sterile and clean and not getting um, sick. Um, and yeah, I've been trying to think through how to still like talk about the impossibility of purity and 
to embrace this idea of entanglement or porosity without being insensitive to the fact that there are real dangers in the world um, in terms of like preserving one's health and well-being. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yes, it's important in my work in a, in a way that I'm pushing up against always. Yeah, I'm still, um, I can't believe we only have 10 minutes to the hour. Um, I'm still sort of really like ruminating on the unstable archive and thinking through the pulverized archive, the wet archived, the proposed archive for the future deceased. Um, I'm considering how the work lives, like are there instructions for how it should live beyond your lives? Jessica, the photos can be collected, but what becomes of the cremated material? What becomes of your collection that inspires the collection? Um, and Candice, what are the instructions for these works to live in institutions, in collections, whether they be private or, or institutional? You know, I I think you know I think about I think about that a lot, um, but I have no clear, <laughs> clear. There's certain things that certain projects that have clear instructions, and then others are just, you know, um, kind of figuring their way out. I also just wanted to speak for a minute too to like waste as like waste as an archive, and um, when I was making like the cremated the crystals for the pets. There was an installation that I did last year um, where the waste material, so when you make the crystals, the um, there's a lot of waste uh, and residue that is left. And I had put that on the, like I had made a completely dark room that people would enter and their eyes would have to adjust and there was fog in there, but then there was also this kind of like crunching noise because the ashes and crystals, the waste that was made when creating the actual crystals were on on the ground. And so I'm also thinking about like, how do you, how do you archive like the way, like is the waste become an archive as well or is it just like garbage? Um, and Candace, I was wondering too, like for you, for your projects, I'm sure it's like a combination of both. <laughs> Well, I'm kind of like a frugal hoarder. So I don't feel like I, I hate, I hate for anything to be waste. I'm always like, hmm, I have a lot of this like cardboard or I have a lot of this whatever. And like, what can I do? And I, I hold on to it before throwing it away in case I think of something I can do with it. Um, yeah, I was thinking about what that experience you just described would have felt like. And like, it's interesting how much like texture is like a part of that like sensory experience um, and how a person must feel so like transgressive when they find out that, oh, I was walking on this um, these remains, um, kind of like implicated in that disrespect. Um, it's interesting. But now that made me forget what Crystal's question was earlier. What was it? Um, just thinking about sort of how you instruct oh, yeah. institutions um, to take to care for your work. Well, institutions have to step up because nobody's been um, radical enough to like collect any of my major installations because they are problematic and they don't give you the satisfaction of like getting anything. You, um, in many cases, get like a few fragments of objects and a set of instructions, but like certain works, like the hard white body had the iteration I showed you the image of, but it also traveled after it was fired into like a bunch of fragments. It, it was, those fragments were used to house silkworms and porticus and another installation version of it. And then they were um, floating in a flooded pool in Chicago at the Logan Center. Um, where the water line kind of like went up and ended up waterlogging all the books and archival materials and original drawings 
So if you if one was to buy that work, you would get a lot of moldy books and ruined drawings and fragments of porcelain. And I never plan to like recompose or show that again. So so basically no, it's like 20 boxes of these fragments that like no one wants. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, part of the work is meant indirect challenge to that, so it doesn't surprise me. Um, I think their works are almost like, they more they more exist as like stories, like narratives that one can tell about like the proposition that happened in the space physically. Um, yeah. But I also make objects too, that like ceramics and things that are less, less like destroyed lumps of things. Well, I think that's pretty much the end of our hour. Um, to, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, do either of you have any closing things or uh, that we haven't gotten to? Oh, God, my volume down. Um, yeah, before we wrap up, I'm trying to think of any last conclusions. This series was sponsored by the Oklahoma Visual Arts Council. We want to thank them before we leave. Um, Jessica, would you mind reading, um, is it Cold Stone? Um, you correct me, but it's a very short poem. Yeah, it's Cold, cold Blue Stone. Let me see. Yeah, I could read that. Thanks so much, Candace. It was great to talk. Thank with you, you guys. <laughs> thank, thank you for putting this together. And yes, Jessica, so great to talk with you. And I'm excited to hopefully have future future in touchness about what you're working on, Steph. Uh, okay, so cold blue stone. Your eyes like a cold blue stone, a drop in the bucket, a nothing, and everything all at once and never again. This feeling, this place, a blue marble, a speck of dust. They say 70% of what you sweep from under the rug is human. Sweep yourself up and throw yourself in the trash. A dustbin of a life, this life, this life is a dustbin, the most magical dustbin on this cold blue stone. Very nice. I love that. 70% <laughs> of what you sweep up is human. That's so great. What a beautiful line. Well, thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts today. Um, I feel like this conversation could go on a lot longer, but we'll spare you your Saturday and and rewatch um, to revisit some of the ideas. Just a big thank you to Lucas, my co-presenter in this series, three-part series. This is the last part. Thank you, Crystal. Yeah, so thank you. thank you, Jessica. Love your work and really admire what you do. So. We'll conclude with that. Have a great Saturday, everybody. Yeah, great okay. to see both of you. I like your old lady furniture. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>